I'm interested in a rigorous scientific understanding of visual perception. I'm interested, for example, in what really happens when I look at this freshly baked jumbo chocolate chip cookie. Actually, what really happens is I forget about science and just want a bite. But cognitive neuroscientists have actually discovered that a lot goes on when you simply open your eyes and look around. Roughly one-third of your brain's cortex is engaged in vision. When you simply open your eyes, look around this room, see a chocolate chip cookie, billions of neurons and trillions of synapses are springing into action. Some of the areas are shown on the slide. Now this might be surprising to most of us because if we think about vision at all, we think of it as very simple. There's a 3D world out there with objects and colors and all vision does is, like a camera, take a shot, a snapshot of what's already out there. The camera theory of vision. And it turns out that that's not right. You don't need billions of neurons, trillions of synapses to take a snapshot. So what's going on is that we've recognized that vision is a process of construction. You construct in real time all the colors, shapes, motions, and objects that you see. So you, your eyes are closed, you open your eyes, you see a room around you with all these objects and motions and colors. It feels like you're seeing what was already there. But in fact, you're seeing a realm that you create within about 100 milliseconds. It's all the colors and shapes and objects are just created and, and put out there in 3D in about 100 milliseconds. A couple examples, I know it's hard to believe. Um, the cubes here, the top and bottom, do they look the same shade of gray or different? Look quite different, right? But if you close one eye and put your finger over the boundary between them, you'll see that they're exactly the same shade of gray. How many people get it to be the same shade, of, roughly the same shade of gray? Now, if you, if you do that again, if you close one eye, put your finger over that boundary, you'll see the same shade of gray. Now, switch eyes. Does your finger jump? Yeah, your finger jumps, right? What, what, another thing that happens is it, that proves that your two eyes are like two cameras with two different points of view. They actually get different images. But you don't actually see two separate images, right? That's not your conscious experience is two separate images. You see one world. So what happens is you integrate the separate images and you use the differences to compute depth uh, in, in so-called stereo vision. Another example, you might see some bluish bars moving across the screen. In fact, nothing is moving. I have static dots and I'm just changing the colors of individual dots from frame to frame but nothing is moving. But your visual system takes that input of static dots with colors changing and hallucinates bars, puts them in motion and gives you the nice clear edges that you see, and it also gives you the, the glowing blue that you see across it, entirely your construction. We construct, as I said, 3D. You may have seen the Necker cube. When you look at this, of course, it's a flat image but you probably see a cube. How many people can see a cube on the screen? And some of you might see it flip. How, have you seen it flip? Okay. So we're gonna use the cube actually to talk about superposition and entanglement. So you can see either this version where that's in front, that face is in front, and let's call that state zero. I'm using some quantum mechanical symbology there. So let's call that state of the cube that you might see state zero. But then you could also see a different version of the cube, right? And we'll call that state one. And so now I want to ask you, what is the state of the cube when you're not looking? <laughs> right, there's no cube. The, the cube, the, the, the screen is flat. The image is flat, the cube is only there when you put it there. But So where is cube zero when you're not looking? 
it's, it's nowhere. It's, you haven't created it. Whereas cube one is nowhere. So what's the right answer to this question? Well, it's a superposition of the zero and one state. This is actually a superposition. So if you want to have the right mathematical description of what is the state of the cube when you're not looking, you get a superposition of the two constructions that you could make. The coefficients will depend on your probabilities. Now we can take it further. Look at entanglement. The red line and the green line. Let's look at the states of those. Let's call the state of the red line zero if it's close to you on the cube. And let's call it one if it's far away. And the same thing for the green. And the question then is, how should we write the state of the red and green line together? What's the joint state of the red line and the green line on the cube that you're experiencing? Well, intuitively, you're gonna, you can see that whenever the red line is in front, the green line is behind, right? And whenever the green is in front, the red is behind. And that's because they're part of a whole, namely the whole cube. And because of that, they're entangled, and the right description for the state of the red line and the green line is the exact same equation that is the standard equation for entanglement. Now, most cognitive neuroscientists agree with what I've just said in terms of vision being a process of construction. But they tend to think that on evolutionary grounds, um, our constructions are generally veridical. Yes, we are constructing in real time all the shapes, colors, and motions that we see, but we've been shaped by evolution to have constructions that, in the normal case, match reality. If I see a 3D table, the shapes, colors, movements of the table that I perceive in general reflect the truth. And the argument is that those of our predecessors who didn't see truly would have been at a selective disadvantage, a competitive disadvantage, compared to those who saw more truly. And so the ones who saw more truly were more likely to pass on their genes for their perceptual systems that saw more truly. Thousands of generations of that, we're the offspring of those who saw more truly. That's the standard view, by the way. I would say that 99% of the cognitive neuroscientists who study perception believe that. But I've been thinking about this a little bit, and the question is, do we, have we really evolved to see the truth? And um, recently I've been telling my colleagues in cognitive neuroscience that, that I now believe that, that I don't see the truth. That in a very important sense, uh, my perceptions don't reflect reality. And, and remarkably, they tend to agree with me, and, and they're worried. Um, they, they, they say there's, there, there's, there's professional help for that kind of thing. <laughs> but I want to give you my reasons for seriously proposing that we've evolved not to see the truth. Um, but just as a warm-up, Steven Pinker, I think, has a very good um, quote here. He, he says that essentially our minds evolved by natural selection to solve problems that were life and death matters to our ancestors, not to commune with correctness. In other words, the, the bottom line is perception was about keeping you alive long enough to have kids. It wasn't really about truth. And the issue is, will tr is seeing the truth actually going to give you an advantage in staying alive long enough to have kids? Um, and is it the way that we actually see evolution working in nature? And I'll give you a couple examples. The jewel beetle. In the Dongra re region of Western Australia, there's this jewel beetle that's bumpy, glossy, and brown. The males fly, the females are flightless. The males fly around looking for females, and when they find a, a hot female, they alight and mate. But there's another species in the outback of Australia, Homo sapiens, and the males of that species have massive brains that they use to hunt for cold beers. And, and when they've drained a beer, they throw the empty out into the outback. Well, it turns out the beers are bumpy, 
glossy and just the right shade of brown to make these beetles, as you can see, very, very excited, the male beetles. They swarm the bottles. Um, they are not interested in the females anymore. Standard story, leaving the female for the bottle. Uh, <laughs> and the females weren't getting any. The, the species almost went extinct. They had to pass laws in Australia to take the dimples off the bottles. So here's a species where the males had successfully found females for hundreds of thousands, millions of years. It looked like evolution had shaped perceptions that knew what a female was. Apparently not, right? This is, they, now, you know, they were looking for something bumpy, glossy, and brown. The bigger, the better. So it was, it was you know, it was not, you know, the females could complain that the males just didn't have a true insight into what it was, what a female really was, and, and they were right. For, fortunately, that's not the, the case with Homo sapiens. It's not just beetles. The, um, the dragonfly has aquatic nymphs. It has to find water to lay its eggs. It uses a trick. Horizontal polarization. Water does horizontal polarization. But it turns out oil slicks and polished gravestones reflect horizontal polarization even more than water. So when Homo sapiens came along and disturbed their niche, we find dra uh, dragonflies laying their eggs in oil and on gravestones. You can imagine the poor nymph waking up on a gravestone. Is this a message? What? So, so it's a trick. They don't have an insight into reality. They have this cheap trick that was good enough to survive. No insight into reality. The gray lag goose tenderly cares for its young unless there's a volleyball around. It'll chase the volleyball and forget its young. The goslings will need therapy, I think. The, a wasp is being fooled by an orchid. It's actually copulating with the orchid for the orchid's benefit. So this wasp clearly doesn't know what a real female is. It's being fooled. And the stickleback, the males fight each other for territory, but they're interested even more in this thing that doesn't look like a fish. They'll fight that. They'll leave a real stickleback alone and they'll fight that. So they don't really know what their enemy is. One stickleback tried to fight a red postal truck that was going outside. It was red and that's all, all it took. I'll fight that. You might say, well, of course, um, those are lower level creatures. Certainly mammals wouldn't have this problem. And I won't belabor this, but you can see that, um, you know, okay, there we go. So. So even mammals have this problem. Now, the eye, the point is, we've, we're not separate from all these creatures. We've evolved from them. And you can see this in the structure of our eye. Our eye is actually both brilliant design and awful design. The awful part is that we have 120 million photoreceptors at the back of the eye, far away from the lens, in front of them are hundreds of millions of interneurons and blood vessels. The light has to come through the, op through the lens and through all these blood vessels and interneurons before it can be captured by the photoreceptors. Terrible design. And because of this design, all the axons for the interneurons are in the middle of the eye. They have to get out. And so there's a hole punched in the retinal mosaic where you're blind. You have a blind spot. It's, a, it's one kludge after another. It's terrible. All vertebrates have this. So the reason we've got it is we're vertebrates and all vertebrates have this. So there was a mistake early on, hundreds of millions of years ago, or tens of millions of years ago, a mistake was made and we've, we see it in our eyes. It doesn't have to be that way. The octopus, the squid have it right, cephalopods have it right. Photoreceptors in front, interneurons and blood vessels behind. Their eyes evolve separately. But the point is we're not separate different from the other animals, we evolve from animals that don't see the truth. And the question is, do we see the truth? We, are, we see that a lot of animals don't. I can't go into this in detail, but the, the right way to look at this is evolution is a mathematically precise theory now. You don't have to wave your hands and have intuitions. It's mathematically precise. So you can use evolutionary game theory and genetic algorithms run simulations, and I've done this in my lab, my, my students and I, hundreds of thousands, millions of worlds, organisms that see some of the truth, none of the truth, part of the truth, tuned to fitness, and so forth. And what we find is that truth goes extinct. 
when it competes against organisms that are not tuned to the truth, that say none of the truth, but are just tuned to the fitness in, in the world. Uh, and in the case of genetic algorithms, what we find is that truth-seeing organisms don't even get a chance to come on the stage to go extinct. They don't even, they don't even come up. They're, they're so far off the fitness landscape that they're, they're not interesting. So the, the point is that fitness, which is what evolution is about, is distinct from truth. For example, if you're a, if you're a hungry lion, a T-bone steak could convey lots of fitness to you if you're hungry and you want to eat. That same T-bone steak, if you're, a hungry lion, if, you're, if you're a sated lion and you want a mate, well, that steak conveys no fitness at all for that purpose. And if you're a cow in any state, the T-bone steak has no fitness values for you at all. So the point is that fitness and truth, fitness and objective reality, are utterly different things. The same objective reality can have entirely different fitness consequences for different organisms in different states of, of at the same organism and for different actions. And so what evolution has tuned us to are the fitness functions. And that's why the beetle only was tuned to what it needed to see to find females in its niche. It didn't need to know the truth, it just needed a trick. And one reason for the tricks is you need to do things simply and quickly, cheaply. The cheaper the better, because more complexity requires more time and more calories. So it's about having kids, not about seeing the truth. So how can we understand perception being useful if it's not true? I think we have a nice metaphor now that we didn't have just a few years ago. Your desktop interface on your laptop or your mobile device. The desktop has things like the uh, little rectangular icon you see on the lower right hand corner. So it's a blue rectangular icon in the lower right hand corner of the, of the desktop for maybe some file that you're editing. Question, is the file itself, say the text file, blue, rectangular, or in the lower right hand corner of the computer? Of course not. I mean, that's anybody who thought that misunderstands the point of an interface. It's not there to, in some sense, resemble the truth. It's there to hide the truth. You don't want to know about the diodes, the resistors, the megabytes of software. You don't want to know all that stuff. If you had to see that, you would never get your file edited. So the point of the interface is to hide the truth and to give you little symbols that can guide your behavior adaptively. You can get things done. That's all. And that's what the beetle had. It had a little symbol that was not the truth that allowed it to mate. It didn't know what real females were. So, so the idea then is that what evolution has given us is not the truth, but a perceptual system that's like a Windows interface. So space and time, as we experience space in this room, is our desktop. Physical objects like the podium, cups of coffee and so forth, are icons on the desktop. None of it is intended to be the truth. In fact, the point of us seeing in space and time and seeing physical objects is that that's a nice, species-specific, dumbed-down user interface <laughs> that's there to hide the truth. And, and, but it's, it seems complicated to us, but in fact, it's really simple, really simple. And that was the point of it. So now you, one objection you might have is, well, you know, Hoffman, <clears throat> if you think that train coming down the track is just a symbol of your user interface, why don't you step in front of it? And after you're gone and your theory with you, we'll, <clears throat> we'll know there's much more to um, you know, physical objects than being just icons. And, and the point is, I wouldn't step in front of the train for the same reason I wouldn't drag that icon to the trash can. It's not that I take the icon literally. The file isn't blue, rectangular, and so forth. But I do take it seriously. If I drag that icon carelessly to the trash can, I could lose a year of work. And that's the point. We have to take our perceptions seriously. Evolution has given us symbols that we need to take seriously. If you see a snake, don't touch it. If you see a cliff, don't step off. That's what it's evolved to do. It's evolved to keep you alive. But because we have to take it seriously, it does not entail we have to take it literally. And that's the key point. How does this cash out in biology? Well, 
we actually can understand, if we think about all perceptual systems of all organisms, including humans, as interfaces, then we can think about biology, for example, in terms of evolutionary arms races where you're trying to outsmart interfaces. This is the back end of a caterpillar. It's not a snake. There's been an evolutionary arms race where birds are trying to eat the caterpillar, and the caterpillar has evolved to take advantage of weaknesses in the perceptual interface of birds. And there's been this arms race going back and forth to the point where the caterpillar has to get more and more sophisticated in its camouflage or its mimicry to fool the butterflies. Even the, the, colored, the, the highlights on the eyes are fake. So apparently to fool the bird, you need to put fake highlights on your fake eyes, but then it'll work. <laughs> Pretty impressive. That's a moth. It's also trying to fool the interface of birds. It's saying, not only should you not eat me, I'm not a moth, I'm actually an owl, and if you come near me, I'll eat you. Right? So it's, I mean, false advertising is not new with Madison Avenue. It's been there in nature all along. We saw it with the orchid getting the, the um, wasp to, to copulate with it. So it's all about finding the weaknesses and interfaces and, and exploiting them. I consult for various companies and I do exactly that. We, we understand the human interface and we can use it to, you know, these two faces look, maybe look the same to you. I've made a slight difference in one that I won't go into, but that slight difference is I know how to play with your interface and you will buy the product with the face on the left more than the face on the right. We can do this. So it has marketing and advertising implications, but then also it has implications for understanding a key aspect of the intellectual history of, of humanity. We used to believe the Earth is flat, like the cookie I showed you. We literally, until Pythagoras, 600 BC, and then Aristotle really sort of took it off at around 330 BC, everybody, to the extent they thought about it, thought the Earth was flat. And in fact, only it was Pythagoras who figured out it was round, and Aristotle agreed, and and then other cultures, for example, uh, in India, it was in the early centuries, around 300 AD, that they switched from flat earth to a round earth. In China, it was the 17th century AD that they switched. And in other, a lot of aboriginal cultures, including American Indians, flat earth until they were you know, exposed to the other ideas. So why did we think the earth is flat? Well, it looks that way. Right? You can just look around, it looks flat. Any, any fool can see the Earth is flat. And so it was our perceptual systems that we took literally. Then when we went to the spherical Earth, we believed that the Earth was the center of the universe and didn't move. And the reason for that was you could just look, is, is it moving? In, in Southern California it moves once in a while. <laughs> But, but other than that, right, it, it, it looks perfectly still. And it looks like the sun and the moon and the stars are going around. So everybody, everybody believed, um, who, that knew that the Earth wasn't flat, they believed the Earth was round, but it was the center of the universe because it looked that way. Once again, we've been taken in by our perceptions. Um, and, and actually, people were burned at the stake um, during the Inquisition for, for that belief. And Galileo recanted, he was smart enough to recant his view, um, but was under house arrest for all of his life, um, his later life, because of his belief that the Earth is not the center of the universe. That's how deeply we are fooled by our perceptions. What I'm saying is that our the, we had to give up flat Earth, we had to give up the geocentric universe. Those were just warm-ups. Now what we have to give up is the very notion that our perceptions of space and time and physical objects themselves reflect reality. We're being fooled by space and time and physical objects just like we were fooled about flat Earth and the geocentric universe. Only now we have to give up all of our perceptions as reflecting reality, not just a little bit here and there. And this has implications as well for the main topic of this conference, which is how is consciousness related to the body, the mind-body problem. And the, the reason it has an implication for that is most theories of the mind-body problem assume that the physical world, including neurons, exists 
independently of perception, that that's the objective reality. And as a result, they try to take neurons as the starting point for theoretical accounts of consciousness. And what I'm saying is, neurons are just a species-specific symbol. They're not the reality. One implication of this whole theory is that neural activity causes nothing. Because, just like, for example, if I take the icon on the desktop and I drag it to the trash can, it looks like the movement of the icon to the trash can caused the file to be deleted. But that's just a useful fiction. Actually, there's no feedback from the screen to the computer. It's a useful fiction on the interface to think that physical objects have causal powers, but it's false. And so neural activity causes nothing. I do, by the way, I've done, I've published fMRI and EEG studies, so I do neuroscience, but I have to reinterpret the data in a different way. I don't take neurons as the fundamental reality. So as a result, the physicalist theories of consciousness are doomed to fail, and that's why we've made no progress. I mean, we've literally made no progress. It's called the hard problem of consciousness because we can't make progress that way. So, most theorists today try to start with the physical and try to get consciousness coming out of it. I'm interested in the opposite, and I'll just at top level sketch the ideas. We won't have time to go into detail here. But the idea is to um, start with a very simple formalism. The tip from Turing is that Alan Turing decided to give a theory of what is computation. And he came up with this really simple formalism, a little machine that has a finite set of states, finite set of symbols, some simple transition rules, and it turned out he could prove that any computation could be done by this simple little device called a Turing machine. And that was what launched the theory of computation, computer science. So the idea is, can we do the same thing for consciousness? Can we come up with a simple formalism which will handle all aspects of consciousness? Maybe we can't, um, but it's worth a try. And so I'm going to give you my intuitions, and we'll and the idea is to have a rigorous formalism so that we can find out, you know, where it's wrong. So if, if we're absolutely explicit, we can see explicitly where we're wrong. So the idea is that consciousness certainly has experiences involved in it, qualia, as they're called, colors and pains and, and emotions and so forth. Um, we also have the ability to um, make decisions, or, you know, actions, take actions. And those will affect the world, whatever the world is. And the world then will affect our experiences. And we can just translate this then into some mathematical symbols. We have a world W, experiences X, and actions G. And the idea is there's a map. I can go into math. It's a Markovian kernel. A perception map, a decision map, and an action map. And an integer counter to count the number of perceptions that you have. And this can be all cashed out mathematically in a, in a different talk. Um, but the idea is a conscious agent is just a sextuple. X, G, P, D, A, and N. So the, and then the claim is that, well, well I'll just say the, we're, those are probability spaces. This is technical stuff. Um, I'll just leave it for the moment. Um, so here's the claim. Every conscious entity and activity can be modeled by conscious agents. So it's a very clear claim. It could be clearly false. Maybe someone will show that it's false. But the idea is, this, I claim this formalism um, and networks of conscious agents, as I'll, as I'll show you briefly, um, can handle all aspects of consciousness and personal experience. So. One hypothesis then about the world is, instead of taking the world to be a physical reality, space and time and physical objects matter and so forth, I take that stuff to be just our desktop, a species-specific desktop, and let's see what happens if we say that the real reality is just consciousness, conscious agents in interaction. That's the conscious realism. So the idea is that it's an ontology. Consciousness is the fundamental. Now we can have, if we have two conscious agents, um, we can make, so here they are, agent one and agent two, 
we can actually take one of these agents and connect it to the other. So what I've done is I've taken one agent and where the world symbol was, I've plugged the other agent in because that's the conscious realism hypothesis. The world consists of conscious agents. So what, what you see is not space and time and physical stuff. It's other conscious agents and your interface is just presenting you that interaction in space as a space-time desktop. So you can actually have conscious agents, they're, they're linked in a network like this. Um, you can do it more abstractly, a graphical symbol like that, where effectively one is sending information to the other and receiving information. They're, they're, so information is flowing between the two. Um, you can have three conscious agents linked together, um, or linked like that. You can have four, and in fact, if you think about it, you can have any number of conscious agents linked together in a network and have, now you have a, a very interesting dynamical systems thing. Uh, you can have introspection. It turns out if you have two conscious agents, the, the mathematics surprised me, it turns out two conscious agents interacting satisfy the definition of one conscious agent. They are also one conscious agent that's introspecting. So what comes out of this mathematics is a model of introspection that's completely rigorous. You can have, so now more abstractly, each dot is a conscious agent, each link is a connection between conscious agents where they're communicating with each other. You can have arbitrary graphs of conscious agents, and it turns out to be a theorem that given any graph of conscious agents, any subset of the conscious agents constitute a new single conscious agent. Surprising result. So, any subgraph is a conscious agent. So, the claim then is that conscious agent networks, these networks of conscious agents, first, it's a theorem that they have the power of universal Turing machines, which means that anything that can be computed by your laptop can also be computed by a network of these conscious agents. They have complete computational power. As a result, all the models that we have of, for example, unconscious processing in cognitive neuroscience. Um, Julia Mossbridge talked a lot about the unconscious processes. We have lots of models in cognitive science, mathematically precise models of unconscious processes. All of those models can be re-expressed in terms of the computations of networks of conscious agents, every one of them. Plus, consciousness itself can be modeled. Um, and each consciousness model, a like conscious agent network model, is itself a new conscious agent. So each one is, is, is like an object-oriented programming language, which is really quite nice. It's a, it's a new architecture for a new architecture for thinking about unconscious and conscious processes. Really quite striking. Um, and it's a framework then for all cognitive science models. Now, just briefly, if I start with consciousness, I have to. Am I out of time? Six minutes. Okay. Um, if I'm going to, to solve the mind-body problem, I can assume that physics is fundamental and then my burden is to get consciousness. Or what I'm trying to do is the opposite. I assume consciousness is fundamental. Then my burden is to show that all of physics comes out of it, quantum mechanics and so forth comes out of this. And it, and it does. So uh, this is an abstract agent dynamics where the, it's a very simple, each agent can only see one bit of information, zero or one. And you can actually program up these things. I, I want, this is two agents passing information back and forth, zeros or ones. All. And it turns out that when you look at the um, long-term dynamics of these, I'll, I'll just, you'll have to take my word on this. Um, when you look at the long-term dynamics, the states of the two agents become entangled. You actually have an entanglement of the, this is where, the title of my talk, conscious agents actually get entangled because they have different kinds of asymptotic long-term behaviors. And it turns out that when you look at that long-term behavior and write it down, um, so this is, the top was the conscious agent dynamics long-term behavior. And then if you write down the, the wave equation for the free particle in quantum mechanics, it's exactly the same equation. So we can actually read off, this is the non-relativistic case, you can actually read off 
a one-to-one -one mapping between non-relativistic quantum mechanics and this agent dynamics. And I won't go through it. This is the, the actual read-off of the equivalence between space and time and aspects of consciousness. Um, and if you're interested, I've got a paper that, that has the details that we don't have time for. But you can even read off energy and momentum from this. Now, that's non-relativistic, and I'll close by the relativistic. I mean, the ultimate thing is we want to have a relativistic quantum theory falling out of a theory of consciousness. And the direction I'm going on that, and I'm starting to collaborate with Chris Fields and some others on this, is to actually take a system of two conscious agents, and it turns out it can be represented by something called a geometric algebra that I've written down there. And th that geometric algebra is precisely the geometric algebra that describes um, the relativistic um, quantum free particle, massless particle. So, it, so the idea is that we can get um, space-time coming out of this, um, Dirac spinners, and ultimately, you know, using Penrose twist, uh, twisters, maybe even quantum gravity. So the idea is that this program, for it to be successful, has to start with consciousness and give us all of quantum physics. And then we've solved the mind-body problem going the other way. So, yeah, I could take... Uh, so I'll stop with that and a couple of questions. Yes? Just curious, I'm just curious to hear if any of your own personal or contemplative practices have influenced how you've come up with this theory and modeled it and so on. Uh, they, they have. Um, it's an interesting back and forth between the scientific left hemisphere stuff, and I do meditate. Um, I've meditated for more than a decade, and so the two go back and forth, the right hemisphere and left hemisphere talking to each other and trying to work this stuff out. All right, yeah. Yes. How do you incorporate reflex action, you know, in perception decision action, maybe that bypasses right. the conscious action. agent, and right. secondly, memory, in you know, a right. memory capacity. So, so reflex action, which is an unconscious process, the key thing to think about, you might say, well, look, if you're assuming, if you say that consciousness is everything, well, what about unconscious processes? I mean, they're unconscious, so consciousness isn't everything. And the key point here is, if I'm looking at you, talking with you, I, your, your mental processes are unconscious to me. Right? I, I, I assume you're conscious, but I'm not conscious of your conscious processes. But I'm wise enough to say, just because I'm not conscious of your processes, that doesn't mean you're unconscious. Right? I, and you'd be pretty cross if I said you're, because I can't see your conscious, but you're, you're unconscious. Same thing is true of my own unconscious processes. Just because I'm not conscious of them doesn't mean that somebody inside me isn't. So the idea that comes out of this is that I'm not just one conscious agent, I'm a whole infinite network. Those graphs I was showing you of conscious agents and reflexes and memory come out of the interactions that perhaps I'm not aware of. So you have this distributed notion of consciousness. So I call that whole network of conscious agents my instantiation. We each have an instantiation and we're only aware of some small part of that instantiation. Yes, uh, well, I'll let you pick. Um, first of all, thank you for the wonderful talk. I enjoyed thank it you. very much. Um, so all our senses, all our perceptions, can they be equated to a number of uh, complicated sets of electrical and chemical reactions? Good question. So and our... uh, one more part, if you don't sure. mind. Okay. So just kind of like very funny question. So do our senses, do they perceive the outside, outside world or do they create it? So two good questions. First, the, are, are, we, are electrical and chemical interactions real? And the answer is they're in space and time. And anything in space and time is ipso facto, or by, by that fact itself, part of our desktop. It's part of our species-specific way of representing things. So to, to take it one step further, someone might say, well, you know, Hoffman, um, your theory is not new. Physicists have told us since 1916 or so 
since Rutherford that this table, this desktop, is uh, mostly um, empty space. It's, you know, empty space with atoms. And so that's the, the reality, is, is the atoms. And, and so we don't see the reality, but, but that's the reality. And I'm saying something different. I'm saying that that's a mistake. It's the same mistake as saying, I know that my desktop isn't the truth of the computer, but if I get out my magnifying glass and look really close, I see pixels, and that's the truth. That's the ultimate reality. And that's the mistake. So I'm saying something utterly different and far more scary than what the physicists have been saying since Rutherford. It's not that this is mostly empty space. Even the atoms and chemicals themselves are part of the desktop. They're, part of the sp they're looking at the pixels on the screen. Can you remind me of your second question? The, uh, do the, the outside world, in our sense, yes. do we perceive something outside us? Yes. So, yes, do we perceive something outside us when we see, or do, do we construct what we see? And the answer is both. What we're interacting with is other conscious agents. So we're actually seeing conscious agents when we see anything. But we don't see them typically as conscious agents. Now, when I see you, I get some hint of who you are as a conscious agent. When I see a cat, a little bit less. When I see a rat, even less. When I see an ant, very less. When I get down to things that I call rocks and stones, my interface has pretty much given up, right? The idea is I'm still interacting with conscious agents, but I have limited resources. I can't, I mean, I'm finite, this is an infinite universe, I have to give up at some point. And so I give up and I call things rocks and dirt and stuff like that, inanimate stuff. And, and, and then what we do is we reify the limitations of our perceptions and make them what we think are part of an objective reality. That's, so then, that's what humans always do. We take the limits of our perceptions, we reify them, and say that's objective reality. So it's our, the space and time and objects are all our construction. We are constructing, but it's in response to what we actually interact with in the external world, which is conscious agents. Um, One last question, okay. Way in the back. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Um, and I was very hopeful because I saw some real animals and living creatures in the slides. So my real question is, uh, unless we are talking yet about, a, about another theory of how to explain consciousness, whichever direction you go, um, have you or is there any opportunity for uh, real living entities like uh, the butterfly or the caterpillar to enter that model and validate it? So in yes. other words, how grounded and how useful in this reality mm -hmm. uh, this theory is because it seems much more connected to the ecological status yes. of affair right. and I, of course I'm very interested if it is actually ap applicable to the ecological state a of affairs. Absolutely, I think that this the conscious agent theory applies if, if, it, if it's right, I mean I should again point out that I'm making a very, very bold scientific hypothesis. I'm trying to be absolutely precise so that I can be shown where I'm precisely wrong. And that's the whole point of a scientific. Be absolutely precise, make bold hypotheses that you can then try to falsify. And, and so part of the bold hypothesis is that this conscious agent theory doesn't apply just to humans. It applies to all of biology and that we should understand. I started to give some hints of it, understanding um, interface wars between birds and, and animals and so forth. I think biology of other animals will be best understood as evolution of interfaces and interaction. Mimicry, camouflage is all about arms races between interfaces. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.